Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, uh, I want to thank, uh, first of all, Mike Went, everyone at Woodland Pattern who had a role in making this event happen. Uh, thank you for supporting the release of this anthology by hosting us. Uh, this is a beautiful space. And, um, you know, I, I learned about Woodland Pattern for the first time uh, from Milwaukee Poets Laureate uh, Roberto Harrison and Brenda Cardenas. Uh, thank you for bringing me into this space. Uh, I'm grateful to know about this cultural center. Uh, today we have a, a panel discussion with contributors of the landmark anthology, uh, Latinx Poetics, um, <clears throat> Essays on the Art of Poetry. Hello to those watching online and uh, in the future. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Ruben Quesada. I'm a poet and editor. Uh, I teach poetry and literature at Antioch University Los Angeles and uh, for the UCLA Writers Program. Today's program will uh, begin with some context I'll provide for the anthology. Then each of the presenters will read a poem and an excerpt from their essay in the anthology. And then we'll have a conversation and open it up to questions. Uh, I must add that uh, I teach online uh, today and um, I may have to slip away. So if you don't see me toward the end, that's why. Um, so. Uh, it's my last day of teaching, which is kind of exciting, um, <clears throat> bittersweet. So um, let's get started. Uh, we, have, we have an esteemed panel with us today. And what I'd like to do is um, read the uh, biographies for our uh, panelists. And then, uh, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about the anthology. So with us, uh, joining us remotely is Lorianne Guerrero. Uh, Lorianne is the author of four collections, Babies Under the Skin, A Tongue in the Mouth of Dying, A Crown for Gumecindo, a collaboration with visual artist Maceo Montoya, and I Have Eaten the Rattlesnake, New and Selected Poems. Guerrero was appointed Poet Laureate of San Antonio and of the state of Texas. She holds degrees from Smith College and Drew University and is the writer in residence at, at Texas A&M University where she teaches writing and gender studies. She's currently at work on her fifth collection, a mix of traditional visual poems and essays. Brenda Cardenas is the author of Trace, uh, which is forthcoming from Red Hand Press, Boomerang, and the chapbook's Bread of the Earth, The Last Colors with Roberto Harrison, Achote Seeds, Semillas de Achote with Cristina Garcia, Emi Perez, and Gabriela Errandi Rico, and From the Tongues of Brick and Stone. She also co-edited Resist, Much Obey Little, inaugural poems to the resistance, and Between the Heart and the Land, Latina Poets in the Midwest. Cardenas's poems have appeared in many anthologies, including Kinship, Belonging in a World of Relations, Grabbed Poets and Writers on Sexual Assault, Empowerment and Healing, Ghost Fishing, an Eco-Justice Anthology, Poetry, and The Wind Shifts, New Latino Poetry. Cardenas serves as faculty for the 2021, uh, served as faculty for the 2021 Canto Mundo Writers Retreat and as the 2010-2012 Milwaukee Poet Laureate. She teaches creative writing and US Latinx literature at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. Daniel Borzutsky is a poet and translator who lives in Chicago. His most recent book is written after a massacre in the year 2018. His 2016 collection, The Performance of Becoming Human, won the National Book Award in Poetry. Lake Michigan was a finalist for the Griffin International Prize. His other books include In the Murmurs of the Rotten Carcass Economy, Memories of My Overdevelopment, and The Book of Interfering Bodies. His translation of uh, Gallo Guilliotos Valdivia won the 2017 National Translation Award, and he has also translated collections by Raul Zurita and Jaime Luis Hun Hunun, Hunun. I apologize for that. He teaches in the English and Latin American and Latino Studies program at the University of Chicago, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. So I want to begin with. Um, an excerpt from the introduction that I wrote and some context about the origins of the anthology. So 
This anthology would not exist, firstly, with the help that I received from uh, my editor, Elise McHugh, and poet Natalie Center Zapico, uh, and others over the years who put up with my shenanigans. Uh, the idea for this book came in, um, in the early 2000s when I was a graduate student uh, in the MFA program at UC Riverside. I read a book by poet uh, Dana Joya called 20th Century American Poetics. The book contains an essay by Julia Alvarez titled, So Much Depends. And in it, Alvarez describes how she discovered that William Carlos Williams was Puerto Rican. She describes how she was drawn to the language and rhythm of poetry. She found this by connecting to his use of syntax, like her native Spanish. But her life experience was not in the liter literature she was taught. She sought stories that reflected experiences like her own. Additionally, Alvarez concludes that by writing powerfully about Latino culture, we are forging a tradition and creating a literature that will widen and enrich the existing canon. She writes, so much depends upon our feeling that we have the right and responsibility to do this. It's an honor to have this book published by the University of New Mexico Press. Uh, the press introduced me to poets like Paula Gunn Allen, Gabriela Mestral, and much more writers of Latin American and indigenous heritage. And just as they'd done, I wanted to introduce poets of Latin American heritage to all types of readers. This is the first time uh, these contemporary, contemporary voices have been collected in an anthology of essays on poetry with such breadth and scope. One unique feature of this anthology is the writing style and form of the essays. Every essay is quite different, offering a glimpse into the minds of working poets in the early 21st century. The contributors to this collection come from all walks of life. They are teachers, scholars, homemakers, laureates, physicians, and activists. These essays are for educators, writers, and lovers of poetry. It was important to me to include academic and artistic philosophies in this book. I spent the last decade as a student and teacher and wanted to learn from poets living in the world with me. In her essay, Peopleness, Ethnicity, and the Latinx Poem, poet Valerie Martinez remarks on the proliferation of Latinx poets and writes, poetry is a phenomenon that reveals the complexity of our voices, styles, perspectives, and literary identities. Martinez identifies that we live in a world that would be poorer if these without these complex identities. For poet Orlando Menez, the very tools poets use, words, kept him from fully realizing his potential. He remembers, one of my linguistic handicaps was having an inadequate vocabulary. So I took it upon myself to memorize new words from the dictionary or any other text, keeping a vocabulary journal. Words endowed with power through faith and science in composition, the compression of sentences into lines waiting to be unpacked by readers, permits us to realize more than we imagined we could understand. Poetry reminds us that our human experience has always been complicated. It enlarges our view of the world and expands our understanding of humanity. We live in a time where people are reading and writing more than ever. For poets and writers who are the makers of the world, the curators of history, words carry the weight of calling the world to action, awakening its readers to the beauty and the ugliness that surrounds us today. In the spring of 2006, Francisco Aragon published an anthology titled The Wind Shifts, New Latinx Poetry. It collects poetry from, from Latinx poets around the country, and in an interview, Aragon acknowledges the importance of contemporary Latinx poets assimilating into American culture without losing sight of their Latinx identity by drawing on the social and political movements of the 1970s via code switching through an artful use of language to create a mosaic of emotion and story. In 2013, an anthology called Angels of the Americlips, an anthology of new Latina Latino writing edited by Carmen Jimenez and John Chavez, was the first major mixed genre anthology focused on Latinx literature's innovative and experimental strand. 
Over the last decade, Latinx poets have created a written world of experiences. These contributions account for an increasingly pluralistic representation in contemporary writing. And I turn to essays on the art of poetry to find the resiliency of poetic composition that will outlast us all. It is through the commonality of language and associative meaning that reminds uh, that readers find a connection to a depicted experience. I recognize the importance of my Latinx predecessors, the influence that history and American literature have had on their work, their intersection with my history, and our impact on the American literary tradition. These essays are an examination. They further record what Latinx poets observe as the nature and function of poetry in their lives and in the fabric of American literature. These essays offer a deeper perspective on the richness and excellence of Latinx literature. And without further ado, it's my pleasure to present uh, our first presenter here, uh, Lorianne Guerrero, who comes to us from Texas. Hi, Lorianne. Hi. Hello, everybody. Hi. Can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think there's a little bit of a delay. Um, so I wanted to say, um, be, first of all, what an honor to be included in this anthology. Ruben, you did an amazing job, um, so thank you. Um, um, the essay that, I, that, I, that is published in this anthology is a um, sort of an exploration of writing a heroic crown of sonnets. Um, that I wrote a heroic crown of sonnets for my grandfather. The book is called A Crown for Gumecindo. Um, and after writing Stringing up Gabrico over fire. He told stories of his brothers and sisters about love and death. He told stories because he never really learned to write. I see now that because we sm spent small amounts of time together, the hour between homework and dinner, Saturday morning before chores, and because he told his stories for years, they were tight, well thought out, precise, the pacing was always perfect, and his tone always turned just right. When I discovered poetry, I recognized my grandpa's style, whole worlds in bite-sized bits. Grandpa, who learned how to record and revise in his head because he didn't know how to write, was the first and greatest poet I knew. I've been thinking about that tomato garden for two years, how efficient it was, how calculated, and two, how this kind of system is one that is passed down from, gener from previous generations, inherited by those who would have to find a way to feed themselves, adjusting and readjusting to the elements, 
to modernisms, the tomato garden was grandpa's sonnet. And while I had a hard time finding an access point into the sonnet, I was well aware of the workings of a tomato garden. And then that what I knew then that what I had chosen, this working of sonnets, was like a return to that field between our two houses. The challenge that I had taken on excited me, brought the only kind of engagement that could bring me comfort. I thought too about the heroic crown and how one and how the last line of one sonnet would pull you into the next, just like the water trickling over into the next row of tomatoes. I wrestled with the idea of using a form for a man who would never know it. I thought about how he created, how he sustained himself. He used what he had. It was then that I really understood the magnitude of my own education. I knew how to write in English. I knew poetry. I knew sonnets. I too used what I had. I began to think of building sonnets as my grandpa built houses and gardens. I knew I didn't want to write sonnets that looked or sounded like what anyone else was used to. I wanted them to feel indigenous, easy from the earth. I remembered my grandfather in his workshop, how he often left edges of a table, a birdhouse, a slab of sheetrock, a little roughed up, never perfect. On the kitchen hutch he made for me of reclaimed wood, he left an emptied wasp's nest, intact and attached. Character, he said. I wanted sonnets like that, roughed up and with wasp nest attached, dampened with rainwater, smelling of dirt. My sonnets are not perfect in the English or Italian sense, but charactered like us, working class, rough, Tejano, maybe even beautiful. So, um, let me see. Uh -oh. um, I'm going to read um, real quick. Uh oh, I lost you. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to read um, three little sonnets uh, just so you can see how they um, work together. The first one is stone fruit. Good, I would ask. Good enough, you would say, of the wine we made from plums. Didn't we for years tend the mother tree? Didn't we for years prune, pluck, hold in our hands the purpled bodies bursting that begged me next have me? Weren't we so nourished in the nerve? Someone is buying our tree. You are reduced to pit. I put seed in dirt, wait, to, wait for you to come back to me in a jar by the window. You are not growing. Aren't you a plum? Little red, little kidney, little mouth, singing, calling, I'm here, I'm here. I thought the dirt would give you something to take hold of. I've buried everything I've ever loved. Cascading. I've buried everything I've ever loved in the bone of reason. Now, even in dreams, you are dead. Sometimes I wheel your metal-colored coffin to the grocery store, once to a papery, twice to Fiesta Bakery on Pleasanton. You are heavy. Once I was in high school in a play and parked you stage left. Always I shake you. Wake up, damn you. Sometimes the casket is open and I kick you. And when in my small shoes I make contact, your ribs crumble like the bark of an old mesquite. Wake up, wake up. We can't run the numbers, argue, make your mother's bread if you are always going to be dead. If you are always going to be dead, who then will melt away the breasts from my chest? Need more my eyes than the unraveling of my hips. In your house, I was all bedrock and teeth, a stopped clock, just as much man as woman or rain. You were blind and I loved you for it. In your house, my shoulders grew to fit the work. Patience blossomed upon my head, a crown. You were my mirror, my name, 
ready plum of my right hand, my ancient and rivered neck, my compass, my wing, my open gate, my sleepless legion, as if I had been born male. My kingdom come. And one day in hot July, my kingdom gone. Thank you all very much. Hello, I'm Brenda Cardenas, and um, I too want to thank um, Ruben for all of his work on this anthology and I'm grateful to be in it and thank Woodland Pattern for hosting us. Um, and it's great to be here with Ruben and Daniel and Lorianne, um, all poets that, whom I respect um, deeply. So my essay is very weird in that <laughs> it be, it be, it's kind of bookended with personal experience, but in the middle, it launches into this whole academic argument, right? Um, and so it's hard to excerpt, but I'm going to read a little part from the middle and then um, a part from the end. It's called Poetry in Concert with the Visual Arts, Latinx Ekphrasis, and Other Inter-Arts Fusions. Um, and um, I'm, I'm kind of in it exploring um, my, you know, my own, the way I'm drawn to visual art and into writing and conversation with visual art and to what I've seen other Latinx poets do with, those, with this particular mode um, and how what I see them doing, you know, uh, is, is particular, right, to, to Latinx poets. Also, um, it looks at the history of ekphrasis and, and, and the, the way that it's been, it's been kind of theoretically fraught a um, lot of controversial concerns, and it, it asks for a, an opening up or um, an extension um, of the, those older traditional definitions uh, of what ekphrasis can do. Um, so I'm just going to begin with this little excerpt um, from the middle of the essay. In Museum Meditations, Reframing Ekphrasis in Contemporary American Poetry, Barbara K. Fisher makes a space for ekphrasis as an interpretive occasion and a critical tool, a mode that involves description, enumeration, analysis, comparison, citation, questioning, critique, assessment, summation, and judgment. She points out that a number of contemporary ekphrastic poems address non-representational visual works, while some, quote, may not represent their subjects at all riffing off of their visual sources more tangentially and interrogatively, end quote. These important insights are in keeping with Katie Geha and Travis Nichols' notion of expressis as, quote, a process of correspondence between words and images, between signs, between marks on the page and marks on the canvas between texts, end quote. In their introductory article to the catalog, Poets on Painters, they discuss the poems in their exhibition as non-sites that represent the paintings without resembling them. Geha writes, I like to think of this as a constant correspondence or the constant reflection of any one origin. I like to think of this as constant correspondence or the constant reflection of any one origin. Instead of having a discrete painting on the wall or finished poem on the page, both points are charged and constantly representing one another, allowing the word and the image to constantly shift, illuminating the other's trace while refusing to act as static objects. The more dynamic and nuanced spectrum of relations between word and image, especially notions of ekphrasis as conversation, correspondence, riff, or critical tool, applies to much of the contemporary ekphrastic poetry written by Latinos, Latinas in recent years. Yet, it is important to note that Latinx ekphrasis may have deeper roots outside of Euro-American literature and theory, and, and inside a long tradition of Latinx interdisciplinary arts that bring together word, image, and music. 
one of the very first invitations I received to give a public reading of my own poetry outside of my home state was par to participate in a 1993 Flor y Canto celebration in Fort Collins, Colorado, with such literary luminaries as Lorna Di Cervantes and Lalo Delgado. The Floricanto Flower and Song Festivals, popular in the Chicano artist activist communities, especially in the 1960s and 70s, derived from pre-Columbian Aztec feasts called in Xochitl in Cuicuatl, which included poetry recitation, writing, painting, and music. Historian Miguel Leon Portilla explains that Xochitl Flower and Cuicuatl Song are a reoccurring semantic couplet in Nahuatl poetry that means poetry, art, symbolism. Certainly, the concept shifted in various ways when adapted to the Chicano project of cultural reclamation, but my sense of that era's floricantos from the stories shared by those who attended them is that they often combined poetry writing and recitation, mural painting, music, dance, and feasting. During the same period, inter-arts cultural festivals and venues flourished in other Latinx communities as well. For example, New York City's El Museo del Barrio, Taller Boricua, and New Yorican Poetry Cafe, while focusing in the first two cases on the visual arts and in the third on poetry, all became spaces that host multiple arts, both as separate exhibitions or performances and as inter-arts fusions. Um, uh, Okay, I'm gonna stop there with that part and then I'm going to go to the end here. Um, I have written poems in response to prints, paintings, drawings, earthworks, installations, glass art, sculptures, performance art, photographs, and assemblage by artists living and dead, artists whom I have known personally and locally as well as those I have never met. Some of these engage engagements have been more, than, more successful than others, but they have always led me to a more multifaceted understanding of the artist's work and a deeper appreciation for the concerns it expresses. Some poems have been inspired by multiple kinds of art. I still relish the experience I shared with Chicago artist Roberto Valadez when he asked me to write a poem in response to his painting, Arbo de Blues which he conceived as an ofrenda, an offering and an elegy to the Delta blues musician, Jimmy Davis. I wrote at the base of the blues tree only after listening to Valadez's stories about how he first came to know the blues and the Chicago musicians who played at the Maxwell Street Market where the borders between Mexican Americans and African American communities became a bit less pronounced. We shared those stories while listening to recordings of Davis and live jams by other Delta blues men. The poem incorporates images from the painting to be sure, but it also riffs on the music and the stories that Valadez wanted to share. More, import more recently, I participated in Mind the Gap, a project curated by artists Tim Abel and Sarah R. Parr. They invited nine writers to contribute ekphrastic pieces on any artwork in the world. They then turned the poems and microfictions over to nine printmakers who created new works based on the literary pieces. The result was an ekphrastic chain link or relay of visual and verbal encounters that landed in a portfolio of prints with an accompanying letterpress booklet of poems and stories. What if a project like this were to travel forward to another writer and then again to a new visual artist what if it traversed many borders to reach its participants? Which traces of each interaction would remain? I am inspired by a profound love of collaboration, forge and respect for difference. A true merging of minds, a third mind, does not erase the thoughts of either or the contexts in which they arise. It embraces the overlaps and the intersections, but it also checks and challenges. It knows when to pause. Moreover, it seeks and often finds that which could only emerge in the exchange. The various projects I have described here involve different degrees of collaboration. And because traditionally an ekphrastic poem comes after the visual art and the artist may not be available for consultation, 
One could argue that it is not a true collaboration at all. My goal, however, is to treat it as such to the fullest extent possible to put the ekphrastic power of the word, as Lesseau has phrased it, to the service of connection that here and there, now and then, self and other not be isolated. And I'll read an ekphrastic poem because I better after that. <laughs> Okay, so this is a poem based on this print. Um, I am obsessed with this Mexican artist, um, Eric Ricardo de Luna Genel, who did an entire series of, of um, not prints, they're drawings, I'm sorry, of drawings that he calls, La Lot it's a loteria deck called uh, Cien Nombres para la Muerte, or 100 Names for Death, and so each card um, is a different depiction of death. And this one is La Ilacha. And um, what you need to know about the poem is that in Mayan cosmology, Ikshel is the goddess of the moon, we water weaving in childbirth who set the universe in motion. She has several aspects. In her dark aspects, she is depicted as a crone wearing a skirt with crossed bones, carrying a serpent and a jug of water. With her jug of water, Ikshel would pour rainstorms and floods onto the land to destroy, cleanse, and make way for rebirth. In another one of her aspects, she's a weaver goddess, whirling drop spindle, whose whirling sp drop spindle is said to be at the center of the motion of the universe. So that's a little background on that goddess. And this poem um, is from my series, Cien Nombres para la Muerte, La Hilacha, The Loose Thread. And it's for Oscar Alberto Martinez Ramirez, Tanya Vanessa Avalos, and their daughter Valeria. Ixchel, skeleton moon at her loom, wipes her furrowed forehead, daddy long legs dangling like loose threads from the corners of her eyes, dark as ditches. She stitches crossbones into skirts weaves skulls into blankets. She will trade with travelers. Mantillas rebosos she'll sing, unfurling her wares for parents to wrap around babes she has guided from their mother's oceans to earth. Under one moon, a Salvadoran father and mother cannot wait any longer in the winding lines of starved asylum seekers ordered to halt. So their daughter, not yet too, wraps her tiny arms around the bow of Poppy's neck, clings to his trunk as he wades into the big river, swims strong as salmon against churning currents. But when he spills her on the bank, warns her to wait, and lunges back into the torrent for mommy, the little one panics, follows. Under one sun, the river carries them away, defying the border <coughs> it never meant to become. Ikshel's waning crescent finds them first, face down in the mud, wrapped together in the black shroud of Poppy's shirt. And from her great jug, holding all the waters of heaven, she spills storms to wash away the lines we've carved, dug, drilled, built in chain link, barbed wire, concrete and steel between desert and desert, river and river, earth and earth, between father and mother, mother and child, under one moon. Thank you. Gracias. afternoon. Thank you so much. Um, uh, first of all, Ruben, for uh, editing and putting together this great anthology, which is a ton of work. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm honored to be a part of it. Uh, thanks to Lori Ann, uh, not on the screen there, wherever you are uh, in, in, in your home. Uh, Brenda and uh, everybody for, um, for being here. It's um, wonderful but to be back at Woodland Pattern. I have I think the first time I ever read in Woodland Pattern was probably like 2003 or 2004, uh, coming from Chicago, and um, and uh, I have been coming ever since. And so it's really nice to to be here, and it's uh, it's been a part of my writing life um, for such a long time. 
Um, so, um, so my essay is called What the Neoliberal Policy Lab Labs Eat and Shit, Horrific Fables for a Specific Universe. Uh, it takes its title from a line from an um, uh, essay by Don Miche uh, on, on Kim Hyosun from her chapbook called Freely Frayed, Race and Nation. Um, I'll read the, uh, the, the passage from um, Don Miche. Uh, quote, my translational intent has nothing to do with personal growth, intellectual exercise, or cultural exchange, which implies an equal standing of some sort. South Korea and the US are not equal. I am not transnationally equal. My intent is to expose what a neo-colony is, what it does to its own, what it eats and shits. Uh, Kim Hyosun's poetry reveals all this, and this is why I translate her. Um, so the, uh, my essay then has four parts. Uh, the first part, and I'll read from the kind of middle parts, maybe just th uh, the second and third. Uh, the first part is, um, thinking about the ways in which uh, work in translation, including work from Latin America, has been received, uh, and um, the ways in which it has often been kind of dismissed in an English context for um, representing experiences that are not universal. Um, and, and thinking about that as a sort of um, judgment passed upon, in particular, uh, poetries or, or literatures from other countries, uh, and, um, and how that how that operates. And at the same time, um, I feel like there's another kind of strand of criticism when work is too specific um, as, as well. Well, when work is um, too specific to, to its environment, I guess it's the same thing. But, but um, that, uh, and so the, the essay is kind of going back and forth between thinking about um, universality and specificity and how those two things operate um, together and form bases uh, for how people read and perhaps misread um, writing. Uh, the um, middle sections um, deal with a kind of um, sort of personal poetics uh, in the sense that it's thinking about, um, for me, the ways in which um, Chile and Chicago intersect as sort of joint neo-colonial policy labs, um, or sorry, neoliberal policy labs, um, I should say. Uh, and, uh, and then towards the end, I look at some specific writers, and in particular, um, writers, uh, from writers writing about femicide both in Mexico and the Southwest in the context of the border and maquiladoras and um, the kind of use of specific naming in, um, in those works. So um, I will look at a couple, uh, a, a small section of the essay. Um, so this is the third part. I come from a Chile and a Chicago that have both been labeled as, quote, neoliberal policy labs. A Chicago that copies Chile's hyper-marketized governance that denigrates collective institutions, which according to University of Illinois at Chicago education policy scholar Pauline Lippmann involves, quote, gutting social welfare and privatizing public assets as the new urban dogma privatizing bridges, she's talking about Chicago, I should say, uh, privatizing bridges, parking meters, public parking garages, schools, hospitals, and public housing while driving down the cost of labor through deregulation, outsourcing union jobs, and casualized and contingent labor. To deal with the contradictions produced by neoliberal policies in Chicago and nationally, and I would say internationally, the privatizing state is also a punitive state that polices and contains immigrants, homeless people, the dispossessed, and low-income communities of color, particularly youth and their political resistance. Chicago is notorious for its police torture scandals and brutal policing of African American and Latino communities. In short, neoliberal urbanism has set in motion new forms of state-assisted economic, social, and spatial inequality, marginality, exclusion, and punishment. These are policies designed 40 years ago at the University of Chicago, 
50 years ago, I guess. Um, I don't know when I wrote this thing. Um, I might, might have started it uh, when it was 40 years ago. These are policies designed 50 years ago at the University of Chicago, <laughs> tested out in the neoliberal policy lab, created under the smokescreen of murder and torture by the Pinochet dictatorship. Policies that included mass privatizations of education, this is in Chile, healthcare and public services, which destroyed labor, labor unions and created a brutal financial dictatorship where the consolidation of wealth and power destroyed the working class, destroyed the environment, caused massive poverty and homelessness. These were policies that began in Chile, and these policies thrive in Chicago today. Uh, we could, in fact, take Pauline Lippmann's paragraph above, and with the exception of the discussion of race, replace Chicago and Chile. And while some might say that my comparison of violence in Chile and Chicago is hyperbolic or inaccurate, to understand the discussion more broadly, one need only look at the numbers of people tortured and abused by the Chicago police, the number of people killed on the streets each year, the literally hundreds of thousands of poor children left to struggle in impoverished public schools that lack the most basic resources. And the recent reporting about police torture centers in Chicago, this is 2015 then, uh, where unregistered prison, prison, prisoners are disappeared only further justifies this point. I know, of course, that there are differences between the two places, but I am sick of in comparisons of playing the witch apocalypse is worse game. All the brutal neo liberal policy labs are murder zones and someone tortured or killed by the Chicago police is just as dead or tortured as someone tortured or killed by the Pinochet regime. Uh, or as Michael Dowdy points out in his book Broken Souths, the economic policies of the Chicago boys, quote, were designed to erase specificities of place and to displace socialist as well as Keynesian versions of economy and society. An erasure that, in my view, traveled from Chicago to Chile and now back to Chicago again. Uh, so I conclude um, the essay by um, thinking about a few different poets. So I want to conclude by mentioning three works of poetry that are unabashedly specific in their discussions of local violence, while at the same time asking us to situate this violence within a broader global continuum. Uh, the three works are Valerie Martinez's 2010 book-length poem, Each and Her, Juan Felipe Herrera's poem, Senorita X, Song for the Yellow-Robed Girl from Juarez, and Mexican poet Maria Rivera's Los Muertos, uh, translated by uh, Jen Hoffer, and I'll discuss the first two, Martinez and, and Herrera. So in Each and Her, Valerie Martinez documents with facts, names, and narratives, the deaths of hundreds of young Mexican girls and women along the US-Mexico border. Many of these women worked in the maquiladoras. They were murdered, tortured, raped, and mutilated. Uh, here's one section of each and her. The number of girls and women working in the post-NAFTA maquiladora industry, 472,423. While they can't be hired legally, at the age of 16, it is common for these girl women to get false documents, start work at 12, 13, 14. And another section, uh, which simply names names and the dates that uh, they were uh, killed. Jessica Lizalde Leon, 3-14-93. Lorenza Isela Gonzalez, 4-25-94. Erica Garcia Morena, 7-16-95. Sonia Yvette Ramirez, 8-10-96. Juana Iniguez Mares, 10-23-97. And the list goes on. In each and her, there is love for the dead communicated through an inferno rendering poetry that always brings us back to the ways in which the abstractions of bureaucracy and government and capital destroy real, actual human bodies. We have the names of those who died, but we don't, do not have the names of their killers. The absence of the names of the killers perhaps amplifies the presence of the names of the murdered women. In doing this, Martinez forces us to confront the names, the individuals, the lives obliterated at the conjunction of the military police state, narco-trafficking juntas, border and immigration, police, and the exploitative practices of international capitalism. To name the names of the dead and to write them of poetry is not to aestheticize them. 
Rather, it's to force the readers to witness the dead. It is to prevent the dead from disappearing permanently. It is to ask us to consider what it means for our bodies to live knowing that other bodies have been slaughtered, knowing that our own bodies are complicit in their slaughter, knowing that our own lives are, if we care enough to think about it, intricately connected with their deaths. And this approach to naming is also used by Juan Felipe Herrera in his poem, Senorita X, Song for the Yellow-Robed Girl from Juarez, uh, which states, uh, the report has been filed in accordance with the proper policy for identifying the dead. Who's the killer, Brenda Berenice Delgado? Who's the killer, Alma Chavira? Who's the killer, Veronica Martinez Hernandez? Who's the killer, Esmeralda Herrera Monreal? And that list goes on as well. Edith's poem names the names of the dead, perhaps, so that we might look for their lives, so that we might understand them as individuals, as girls and women whose lives and deaths ought to mean something to us. The first name on Herrera's list is Brenda Berenice Delgado, who according to the website of El Universal Nación was only five years old when she was found murdered in 2003. Words fail us here. It is a darkness we can barely consider. Admittedly, I'm engaging with the poem in a way that most readers would not, but in reality, I'm doing no more than accepting an invitation the poem offers. One way, then, of understanding the naming of the names is as a means of maintaining a public record of giving the dead more respect than they were given by the state, by their employers, and by their unnamed and anonymous murderers. It honors the people who were disposed of. It is a memorialization and a condemnation, a record of an atrocity, a communal and horrific failure that is at once local and global. And, um, and I will read, um, I'll read a, a newish poem uh, that um, um, will, will be part of a book that comes out, uh, I think, in 2024. This is called Apparatus, uh, Apparatus number 519. <clears throat> the part, the whole, the dead, the corpse, the foot, the light, the flesh, the wage, the worker, the regulator, the lie in the code of the body. It broke on the edge of itself. I did not know what I knew was true, that my eyes were blank, that my face was blank, that my bone was blank, that my body was owned by the shareholders, that my body was just meat now, that my body was just debt now, that time death was murmuring so loud and I could only hear the dead rain, the squeak, the buzz, the machine, the breath, the hatred, the fumble, the finger, the blow, the key, the sun, the brain, the bubbling, the cooling, the box, the space, the fold, the silence, the plank, I dropped all my capital in the supermarket. I was a young language with no verbs. I saw my stitches photographed from the inside. The police touched me frankly, so directly. They took me to the mask, the shield, the armor, the stone that's placed on the grave, the body that's left in the ground, the mountain they moved to the city, the beach that sunk in the city, the river that lost its water, the lake that lost its waves, the missing horizon, the missing halo, the children that disappeared into the face of time. The tower, the fire, the pros, the sticks, the woods, the foreclosed mountain we climbed before they threw us into another Wednesday, another Tuesday, another Monday. It's cruel to pray out loud, cruel to pray to a God who loves so discriminately, cruel to eat in public, cruel to sing when your neighbors can't speak, moan, or whisper to the birth that refuses to drop, the death that refuses to rattle, the leg that refuses paralysis. Trust the hammer, but lose the nail. Have faith in the hour, but not the minutes. Don't speak the failed word, the wound word, if it's witness to the frozen, the frosted, the fickle, the inspected, the inspector, the hopeful, the hopeless, the crumbling, the growing, the decaying, the rooting, the sowing, the consuming, the fluid, the formal, the industrious, the callous, the lazy, the blank, at the moment of blank, be empty again. 
Disguise your breath. Disguise the sponge that sops up the water. Disguise the body that destroys its bones, the body that fears its own fingers, the concrete flesh, the privatized flesh, the bank flesh, the murmuring flesh, the murmuring blankness, the exhaustion, the suffering, the numbing, the weathering. I remember honey, but it's gone now. I remember seeds, but we have so few now. I remember the grass and the beach and the river, the bees and the ice, the lake and the mountains and its brokers, its board members, its collateral, its assets, its insurance, its expansion, its reduction. We cataloged the glaciers before they disappeared. We returned the earth to the investors, the anxiety to the anxious, the babies to the umbilical cords, the blood to the state and the bank. Thank you. Wow, incredible. Uh, another round of applause for all our presenters. So uh, we're going to take some time and have a, have a um, I have a few questions, just some, some thoughts that um, I want to kind of uh, pick our, the contributors kind of heads. Um, but you know, one of the things that, uh, one of the questions that I get a lot um, about this anthology um, and that I, I'd, I'd love to hear um, uh, your thoughts uh, are just thinking about, um, thinking about the title itself of the book. So. Um, both the, the word Latinx and the word poetics. Often, I think that there's uh, um, some, some uh, confusion or um, different perspectives on how to define uh, what poetics means, um, how to define what Latinx means. And, um, and I think that my um, definition has changed over time. Um, so when I think about um, the term Latinx, for instance, in the the change of, of, or the addition of the letter X at the end of the word, where the, the plural uh, was once just Latino. Um, and uh, uh, I chose to, to add the X, and, and um, I think Daniel and I had a brief conversation many years ago about the X at the end of Latinx. Uh, but, but for me, the X is a, is a way of being much more inclusive, um, much more, um, uh, I think, uh, uh, way of creating a sense of belonging uh, as opposed to, um, as, as some people have said, creating a binary with, with the word by using the term Latino or Latina. Uh, so it's non-gendered by, by using the X and, and in that way it's much more inclusive. But also, um, when I think about the word poetics, uh, some people I think think of the word poetics as a sense of um, an aesthetic perspective. And when I think of poetics, uh, I think of the, the word as I think as it's defined as, as something that is a creation or a making uh, and in, in thinking about poems or, or just writing in general, it's, it's, it's a way of composing and how, how does one compose? What is our approach to composition? I think that as we've heard today, um, there, there are different ways of thinking what a poem can do uh, for a community, uh, how, it, how it might be able to represent or even exclude certain communities uh, depending on um, how someone interprets a poem. So I think of, of um, the opening of Daniel's essay, for instance, takes a review uh, that a poet named David Kirby wrote of a translated collection. And, and Kirby says that, um, that, that the material is inaccessible because it's so specific, as, as Daniel mentioned. But, um, and so when I think about the specificity of not just descriptions, but of, of words and language, I think of how do we, I think of ways of opening that up and, and creating a greater sense of belonging. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on, uh, you know, what do you, what do you think uh, about the X in Latinx? And also, um, how, do you, how do you interpret or maybe um, uh, share what, what poetics means? Well, the, the X in Latinx, it's funny because, you know, books, it, it, can you hear me through this? Okay, books take a long time, right, from, to come out into the world from the time that we first imagined them. I wrote this essay a long time ago. <laughs> I don't remember when you first solicited it, but it was a while back. And I think I was using Latin A slash O, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. putting the A first. And then 
um, you know, the, the term Latinx came in, I came to understand why people were beginning to use Latinx and again to be, because Spanish is a, Spanish is a gendered language, right? And so you have, you know, the, the ah or the o oh at the end of the word and then that excludes a lot of people who are non-binary in their gender, who are gender fluid, right? Who, and, um, and so I very much liked the idea of the X right, in order to be more inclusive. And so I changed the X in my title. When I was first reading the essay in the book, every time the word's used, it's different. One time it says Latinx, one time it says Latina, oh, ne the next time it says <laughs> Latino A. <laughs> so, um, that's, I guess that was just like the editing process. We changed the title, but we never went back and changed all those. So it's kind of funny that it turned out that way. Um, but no, I would say that I very much embrace the X, although I do understand that it is, it is kind of controversial. Some um, people feel um, that it takes away the Spanish, right? That you have when you do Latina, Latino, right? Um, and um, I mean, there are other reasons that, I mean, I may not be remembering right now why it's so why it has become so controversial. But even the term Latina Latino is controversial. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's what I think is so difficult about this, right? Like, how do you, you know, I mean, like it's so broad and what do we have in common except that in some cases a mother tongue, but that's not even true across the board because there are many Latinx poets whose first language was English. Mine was more Spanglish than it was Spanish or English, right? Um, and then there's, port there's people with Portuguese backgrounds. Was for some so even the language isn't something that we all have in common, you know? And so that, that, whole, that whole thing is problematic. I'll stop there and let Daniel speak a little bit on. Um, sure. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, uh, sp speaking of the other critiques, right? One is that it's elitist. Uh, uh -huh. And yeah, that's we, right. we heard this a lot during the um, elections that, mm -hmm. uh, that um, uh, there was a sort of movement to criticize those who were using that term, saying that, um, oh, and then there was surveys that came out that said only 3% of, of Latinx people uh, use the term Latinx, something like that, right? And like part of, uh, and so then the move is to dismiss it and to say that if, uh, if it is being used um, as an organizing tool, then it is inevitably alienating a large part of the population that it is trying to organize, right? Mm -hmm. um, the move to dismiss it, right, is, 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 um, a, is a funny one in the sense that, like, as Brenda was saying, if we, starting from the 70s, if we chart, like, Hispanic, mm -hmm. uh, Latino, Latina, et cetera, right? Like, they've shifted very regularly and we simply don't know, mm -hmm. right? Like, we don't know what, how long it's going to last, mm -hmm. how it's going to be perceived of, and like the importance for young people to be using the term, who I think embrace it at a much higher rate. Um, so those are like a starting point. There's um, a couple writers who have um, said stuff that I think is interesting. Claudia Millan has a book called Latinx, um, and, and she talks about the X as being um, the unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, and that the X, because of that, has um, a um, both a kind of like aesthetic quality, um, a uh, I don't know if she would say spiritual quality. I might say that, um, but a, a quality that uh, because of it represents the ways in which um, migrants, and in her case, she, or in the book, at least she's talking about Central American migrants in particular, are um, are made invisible. Uh, and, um, and, and so that I think is interesting. She thinks about um, X also in the sort of realm of mathematics, right? X as an equation, um, X as a sort of um, numerical stand in. Um, and, um, and, and, and I don't know if, she, uh, I think this book talks about it, right? But, but another critique as Brenda was saying is that like people don't want to say it. Right, mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's awkward to say, um, and I think we can also turn that around and again say that that is part of its um, usefulness because mm -hmm. um, the people that Latinx is trying to represent um, are, are 
are often in the position of having to use uh, perhaps English, right? Uh, which they don't um, always uh, know how to say, speak comfortably, um, or at least are always having to, um, and are often having to, to deal with the fact that their own, that Spanish has been criminalized in, in mm -hmm. either um, symbolically or um, in some ways um, sort of literally, right? So those are some, um, so those are some thoughts. Um, uh, there's an essay called, uh, or an article uh, by Alan Belez Lopez called The X is, the X in Latin X is a wound, uh, not a trend. And, and Alan in that uh, piece mm -hmm. thinks about the X, um, thinks about, uh, it's this sort of an argument that like, you should, you should use the X if you are willing to kind of, um, think about the ways in which it um, represents a variety of kinds of wounds. One being um, the wound of femicide and misogyny, mm -hmm. another being a wound of um, racism, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Another, uh, uh, the ways in which even among the Latin, Latinx community, they have um, and ignored the needs of black and indigenous uh, people of Latin American origins. Um, to flip it around a little, like the funny thing, I think, like my problem is not with the X, but with like Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, and the mm -hmm. fact that we actually never talk about that, yeah. right? Yeah, um, right. And, right. And like, why is Latin had a lasting um, and uh -huh. descriptor, which is, uh, which ultimately refers back to Europe, right? Uh, and, and, and so like the critiques and all of this yes. um, 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 make, you know, um, are, are so limiting, right, in the sense that uh, it is already sort of, um, you know, perhaps assuming that people in Latin America speak a European language, which they do not always do, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, my hope for the future would be that we, like, I don't care about the acts, like, let's get rid of Latin, um, or <laughs> let's, let, let's at least like, have that conversation. Mm -hmm. um, Ruben asked about poetics, but maybe, like, in a second round, we can talk about it, and can we... What is, about is Lorian? Lorian? Yeah. In, yeah. In, in the mix. Lorianne? Lorianne? Yes, I'm here. Oh. Uh, I, I was busy I was, uh, listening to Daniel's argument on Latin, and I think that's such a, um, a, 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 a conversation we need to have, one that I've been thinking about a lot myself. Um, but I mean, I really don't have much more to add on, on, on the use of the X and uh, Latinx. I think languages evolve, and um, I embrace the X. And like I said, I'd like to talk more about the the, the use of the word Latin. <laughs> I'm with you on that, Daniel. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Poetics. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's quite interesting. Um, and I think I think similarly, opening it up, I, I wonder, um, um, uh, Lorianne, your your essay really focuses on um, creates this relationship, which I think is really uh, lovely about um, the natural world and how your, your, your grandfather's tending of the garden and, and building um, uh, serves as, as, a, as a, an analog for your own composition and your own writing. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, uh, how you define poetics and, and maybe um, you know, how, how, if, how would you um, describe what poetics is to someone? Um, I, uh, gosh, I think that, um, I think, Poetics is a is a very personal thing. I, I I don't think that how I define poetics can be what you know say Brenda how she defines it or how you define it. And I think, um, I think it took me a really long time to understand that as well. Um, especially getting the very Eurocentric educations that we do, um, and so I think it took me a really long time to you know it it took my grandfather passing really to understand um, that poetics for me. Um, meant uh, history and and um, sort of cultivating in order to create um, by looking back at how that was done before whatever whatever was being created right and so for me um, I I follow along those footsteps in order to create the thing that I'm creating which happens to be poetry and so. For me, that's poetics. But also, despite the fact that my grandfather never wrote a poem, he had his own sense of poetics. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. 
Brenda or Daniel? Uh, I, I don't know if I can, I don't know that I have just a definition at the ready, but for me it includes, I think it includes aesthetics, but it also includes, um, it also includes history and context, as Lorianne was saying, right? Um, and I think it also includes, uh, you know, philosophy, approach. So approach might have to do with, um, you know, one's approach to the poem, mm -hmm. right? Might, might, which might have to do to some degree with matters of craft, right? And, you know, in a, in a wider sense, not a, you know, not a nitpicky sense, mm -hmm. right? Um, I, for me, all of that is included in poetics, right? Uh, uh, one's, when I say philosophy, it's also poli pol politic. You know, whether or not one is writing what one would call a political poem, right? There's a political, there's a politic, there's a, there's a political, um, what's the word I want? Um, not agenda, but a political orientation. Maybe. Mm -hmm. um, so I think all of that is included in poetics for me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think maybe just to put the, the two terms together, right? I mean, it's, I guess the phrase sort of assumes that there is like perhaps, um, I mean, Latinx poetics. It is mm -hmm. in the plural, right? But, but I think the, the, the ways in which the outside often views, you know, um, uh, people of Latinx origin is as a homogenous group, right? And so I think like the poetics then um, has a means of like beginning to kind of think about all of the ways in which Latinx writers um, um, form um, poetries, right? And that um, gets us into discussions of, of migration, of regionalism, of um, of multilingualism, of economies, of, of loss, uh, et cetera, et cetera, right? And it can go on and on. And, you know, it hopefully also sort of hopes, um, can rescue um, poetics from like those dreadful debates about the history of the lyric uh, um, with, which, <laughs> with, it, with which it is often um, situated, right? Um, <laughs> And, uh, and so, yeah, I think that's how I would open it up is, is that I think it like, um, it, it allows for a kind of investigation of, in this case, of like the many ways of, of mm -hmm. being Latinx, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's interesting. I, I think of um, uh, Brenda's essay and, and how um, there's, a, there's a moment in your essay that you talk about like this intersectionality that exists uh, through collaboration, mm -hmm. and there were, there was something that really stood out to me in your in your essay that I think um, I think we could all speak to, and that's um, thinking about uh, how um, images in our work can serve to tell stories or, or make arguments, but um, also how how can poetry serve to engage the idea of otherness, I think is how you mm -hmm. put it in your essay. Mm -hmm. And so um, I wonder if, if that's, that's something that, that you think about um, as you're either writing or revising. Uh, you know, what, what comes to mind very clearly in, in, in your work, Daniel, is um, you, you uh, uh, to, to use your word, Brenda, there's this political orientation that exists in the work. Mm -hmm. um, and, and uh, I think I was, I was recently describing um, some of your work to someone as like this, this kind of apocalyptic. And um, I wonder if, if, um, if you all might be able to talk a little bit about how, how you might use your poetry or, or how do you find poetry engaging in otherness? Oh, that's an interesting question. Lorianne, do you want to start? Let me think a little bit about that before I, before I say it. Please. So how, how um, the ways in which, uh, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll take, uh, the ways in which poetry is engaging with otherness? Yes. Is that, is that, um, I mean, uh, I guess in all the ways, I don't know. I mean, I think starting from the lane, like, so starting from, um, I guess, um, it's the ways in which language, uh, the language of poetry is aestheticized, and I think, um, if, um, uh, if, if, if like the whatever political um, orientation or apocalyptic work um, has uh, 
value and meaning, it is um, a different kind of value and meaning than, um, I don't know, expository prose does, right? And that is because it is um, dependent on whatever those sort of poetic um, uh, ideas and, and approaches might be. Um, for, I don't, for me, that otherness is, um, is thinking about, is, is a sort of like otherness you know, I mean, I suppose there's like more direct ones um, about thinking um, ab about sort of othered bodies, right? Mm -hmm. But I think um, the otherness is like um, the otherness of uh, sort of anonymous people who are destroyed by capitalism or the way in which capitalism uh, destroys systems uh, and how that is a kind of like interlinked experience of the Americas. And I think that is. Um, for me, what um, has been like a primary focus of writing over the last 15 or 20 years is to sort of think about um, think about the Americas, think about the interrelations between um, Latin America and the United States uh, through a kind of um, framework of, of, of money and capital and how, um, how the destruction of kind of systems uh, ends up like uh, manifesting in individual people's lives and bodies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not going to be as articulate as that, but I think for me, other it, poetry engaging otherness is, in, you know, it's in part. It for me, it's an, an empathy engaging an empathic sense of right of the other, whether it's through you know, engaging with some other, some artwork that the other has, is, that another person has created, or whether it's in writing about, in, in understanding my own relation to the experiences of others, right? It's, there's definitely a, a sense of empathy there, which I think is really important because I think it's so lacking right now in, in our culture. Um, uh, so that's part of it for me, um, poetry engaging otherness, I think. Also, um, you know, oh, it was like I had another thought and now I lost the thought. So I'll let Laurie mm -hmm. Ann and then I'll come back. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you, Brenda. I think that empathy is really at the heart of that. I think, um, I, I don't think I start writing, certainly with the idea of engaging otherness, but I do focus on um, being completely honest with myself and so vulnerable and I think in doing so in creating the work I create um, because of that sort of extreme vulnerability or just complete honest honesty um, in that way um, engaging with the other self and so um, uh, I think in, in that way, and then I guess with sharing that work or, or um, especially with my students, encouraging my students to do this, you know, there, there then becomes a dialogue about, well, basically empathy. Um, but I think it starts with um, complete honesty and vulnerability. Mm. Mm. That's, that's great. I, I think also that, that in a sense, I can think of it as everything we write is in some sense collaboration. Everything we write is intertextual, whether we know it or not, right? Because we have all of this, everything we've ever read is living within our minds and our bodies, right? And everything we've, you know, and any kind of art we've ever engaged is, is there with us. So there is no way that we can write anything without there being some sort of influence, but I see that in a positive way, not that whole, what was the Peril Bloom's big anxiety of influence. Mm. You, know, the, the, you know, there's no anxiety to me about it. To me, it's, it's that, it's this engagement with all, you know, other texts, other arts, other people, right? And in that engagement, again, it's a, like I was saying before, I see it as a correspondence, I see it as a conversation. I see it as a, you know, an in exchange. I see it as a, um, a, a uh, it moves toward community, community building. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll ask uh, one more question uh -huh. and, and then uh, maybe open it up to uh, see if anyone has any questions. Um, there's, there's a phrase that, that sticks with me um, 
uh, and, and it's um, the phrase of, of a mouthpiece for culture. And, uh, and whether um, the poems that we write uh, are often, I think, uh, or may often be interpreted as a, as a mouthpiece for Latinx culture or uh, the depicted culture. And, uh, and, and this speaks back to um, Daniel's essay about accessibility of experience. Um, and so um, I, I wonder if um, one of the things that I really find valuable about cult poetry that contains or is steeped in some way um, uh, cultural experience or cultural artifacts is that it serves as a, a literacy tool in many ways. It, it, mm. uh, you know, but I think that, that the danger there is that the, the work can, can be interpreted as, as something that represents, some, uh, uh, is, is seen as like a monolith of mm. th this particular experience represents everyone. I think of um, early on when I started writing, uh, there was this um, uh, a conversation going around about whether um, poets should continue to write poems about quinceañeras or abuelas or tortillas, you know, the, these very specific uh, experiences. And so I, I, um, I've, seen, I've seen a you know, range of po poems that, that tackle those very specific cultural experiences, but also um, I'm starting to, to, to find more poems that uh, look out into the world, this exteriority of experiences, and um, there's a po there's a poet named uh, Camille Dungy who uh, who writes about eco eco poetics, and um, and and she sees that we were having a conversation recently about how she sees eco poetics as a a way to um, shift the focus of certain poems uh, into um, a lens that it, that examines nature or the natural world. So kind of calling back to romantic poetry of the 19th century. Um, and it's a, it's a way of reclaiming this space that has for so long been considered a white space. Mm -hmm. uh, and so how do people of color embrace or open up to something beyond uh, the cultural experience? And, and I wonder if, if you ever feel uh, any kind of um, reservation about um, writing from, from that cultural space. Um, I don't know if I feel a reservation, but I don't want to be pinned to that alone, right? I mean, I, I definitely, some of my poems definitely are still coming out of that cultural space and maybe contain some of those cultural signifiers, right? But not all of them, right? So like Trace is all over the place. There's a lot of poems in that book that never reference Chicana or Mexican culture particularly or specifically. Um, they're being written out of this body, so, <laughs> and I think they're, uh, you know, I, I, don't, I, I don't like the essentializing, right, like aspect of it that's, that kind of bothers me. They're being written out of this body, they're being written out of a mind that grew up hearing both languages and hearing them mixed and hearing the quote unquote incorrect Spanish, right, of, of my elders who were, who had like third grade educations, right? Uh, that the, the, the teacher corrected when I took Spanish class in seventh grade and told me my dad was wrong, right? <laughs> like, so they're coming out of, you know, they're coming, they're coming from that, so there might be a way in which, even in a poem that has not a single kind of cultural marker that you could recognize as Mexican or Chicana, um, maybe the way I use language is influenced by what I heard, you know, growing up. But I would say, but that, yeah, I'm gonna leave it there, but yeah. Mm -hmm. There's a certain degree of discomfort. I don't wanna be forced into a, having to write a certain thing that always, you know, if I wanna write about a tree, I wanna write about a tree. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um. I, uh, I don't. I don't. I don't know that. I, I feel as if uh, I, I don't know that I've received that critique necessarily. Right? It might be because of my of my name or my writing or whatever. That um, that that I don't know that that is the first uh, being of of Latin American descent is not the first thing that people think about, um, in, in uh, when they hear my name at least or with my work. Right? Um, 
but I think, you know, I think like Brenda was saying, like nobody wants to sort of be like um, boxed into it, but like the other sort of mistake is to like think that like culture, like where one is writing from means um, is, is like by, if you are including those sorts of things that that makes your work interesting in some way or another, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so it's not so much like, like I, I don't know that we turn that, that like the, the the poets I love most, uh, I feel like I look at their work and think that they're like the only person in the universe who could have made that work, like mm -hmm. regardless of where that uh, where they came from. Uh, and so I, I just feel like the um, the the like act of making art is such a kind of personal and intense one that um, sure like that's part of it, um, but that doesn't. Um, but that's never going to be the thing that is mm -hmm. like what um, gives the art its um, effect or affect. Like it's so mm -hmm. much, so much more, and sometimes kind of unspeakable, uh, and sometimes like um, energetic and rhythmic, uh, mm -hmm. and and all of these things that we turn to art to. And I don't think that that is for me the like, I don't know anywhere in the top you know five mm -hmm. uh, of like what makes me care about a work of art. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm thinking like the, the poem I read, um, my impulse to want to write about these people dying trying to cross the, the Rio Grande or the Rio Bravo, mm -hmm. um, I would have felt how I felt, I would have felt that empathy no matter what background those people had. However, it's part of a, an entire you know, all of, all of what ha is happening and has been happening at the border, right? And, and, and it's part of this, you know, exclusion and this, you know, wall and this, the, the, the kind of falseness to borders to begin with, right? And we're going to keep out these people, right? And it becomes a Latino poem, right? I wouldn't have had any less empathy no matter what the backgrounds of the people were who were trying to cross and, and to whom this happened, though. So I don't know if that sort of fits in with mm -hmm. what you're talking about. Laurieann might want to. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, I'm trying to go back to the original question. Um, I, it's, 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 it's a hard thing to sort of talk about because, you know, I teach, um, I mean, I, you know, I was teaching at Texas State in the graduate program last semester, and I teach intro to poetry at my school, and um, majority of my students are Latina, Latina. And it's interesting to me that, you know, I get so many poems on um, La Llorona, uh, Malinche, <laughs> right? And so it's, um, what I've discovered, what I've learned is that I mean, if I look back to my first book, I have Yorana and Malinche in my first book too. But I think it's part of the process of um, going, like, um, like reconciling our histories, and and I think as as a, as Latinas, um, maybe maybe Mexicanas or Tejanas, um, sort of having to. Um, <coughs> to situate themselves as writers first, um, as storytellers, um, trying to sort of a, a ways of empowering ourselves. And so there's, mm -hmm. you know, I think that those are necessary things. I think my students have to do that the same way I had to do that, right? But I will, but for, for me now, um, I guess like friends, like I don't want to be um, boxed into that and, and I mean, I like to think that I'm, I'm, I did that work already, and so I will never write another Yorana poem, right? But I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe I'll need to reconcile something else later, and I have every right to do that. Mm -hmm. um, and as, as do my students, right? Um, but I think it's an ever-evolving thing, and I think that um, as, as I grow in my thinking and in my work, um, um, you know, re reclaiming things and redefining things and constantly reworking things is important. 
because we have such complex histories, because you know, because um, because of, of of being marginalized, right? Be all for all the reasons, you know. And so, um, I tell my I remember one of my students was like uh, she was young and she maybe nineteen, and she had told me, um, I I think I'm, you know, um, I think I'm writing poems that aren't uh, Mexican enough. And, and I was like, you know, how do you, I can't explain the, the evolution, right, of, of how her writing will, will come or how mine did, right? And so it was like, um, I told her, you know, I, you know, I can write a poem about Malinche and, uh, you know, it's a Mexican or Latina poem, right? I said, but I could also write a poem about beats mm -hmm. and it's a Latina poem mm -hmm. because like Brenda said, right, it comes out of this body. This experience, these eyes, and so um, how how others uh, are going to see me, whether I'm a mouthpiece or not a mouthpiece, or what? I don't give a damn. I mean, that's just the way it is. But I had to. It took a long time to get to the point where I can say that and mean it. You know, I don't know if that really answers your question, but that's, that's where I'm at. Thank you all. Thank you all. You that know, was great. I mean, I think of I think of my husband Roberto's work, and you know. He rare, he doesn't use any of those typical um, signifiers that have become cliches, like you said, right? They've become cliches. And yet the work is definitely, definitely, I think, Latino work. But we were talking about how you open up, and I think, open it up, and I think he does that because he's, you know, he's writing about Panama as an isthmus bridges of the world and, right? <laughs> It's like, you know, very big, you know, large concepts, right, um, uh, that, are let, that are coming out of his experience as uh, a Panamanian, as a Latino writer, but, but they're not talking about, he never talks about, like, I'm trying to think of the, you know, patacones, right, the <laughs> tostor, toston, in, in Panama, Tostones are patacones. You'd never see him talking about patacones in his work. Sure, sure. You know, right? <laughs> am, I, am, I, am I speaking? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> 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 I think it's a really good question about otherness because I do approach things as an other. And that's why I came to poetry. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So I thought that was a very, very interesting part of the conversation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to turn it over to uh, Mike. And uh, Mike will take some, some questions if we have any. I'm gonna slip away and go teach. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Thank you, Ruben, so much. Thank you. Bye, <laughs> Ruben. Bye. Hey, Ruben. Um, so yes, uh, we'll open up for audience questions. I'm gonna repurpose this microphone. Uh, so you can share questions here in the audience, which will give you about 30 seconds, give or take, to think about your questions, right? Um, before I do that, I might um, uh, pass it to you in a moment, Antonio, so heads up. Um, this mic, so I can bring it around, and then I can walk around the room, and I can get your questions. Two notes. One is, if you're on Crowdcast, you can share your questions in the chat, and I'd be glad to read those on your behalf. Um, so please share your questions there, and then those of you in the room, if you could just like raise your hand when you have a question, I can bring a mic around to you, both to amplify your voice here in the room, but that's also so that people on Crowdcast can hear you, um, which is, that's how the audio is coming through to Crowdcast. So one moment while I repurpose this mic, think about your questions. <laughs> All right, here we go. Okay, and here I am again, off screen. Um, does anybody in the room have a question? Yeah, Peter. Thanks, Mike. Um, this question might be like specifically for Brenda, but I'd be really thrilled if, any, if anyone or everyone answered. Um, d reading your essay beforehand and, and hearing you read parts of it again, I was thinking a lot about the different ways in which poets 
and poets who also happen to be visual artists um, approach ekphrasis. For example, mm -hmm. Cecilia Vicuña or Roberto Harrison. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, do you see uh, do you see a difference in how poets and poet artists approach ekphrasis? Uh, and if so, how? Or if not, I guess the question's over. <laughs> uh, no, I think I think that's a great question. I I think I called the essay. You know, the subtitle was ekphrasis and other interarts fusions because, like, I I don't I don't see Cecilia Vicuña doing ekphrasis, right? She's She's not, she's, I don't see her really writing about or in response to or in conversation with another artist's piece of art. Her work is very intertextual because she brings in all these thinkers all the time. She quotes them directly in her poems, right? Different thinkers, different writers, different poets, different. But she is merging. This is what I'm really interested in, where I'd like my, my work to move next. She actually merges the visual and the verbal, right, in, in one text. So she will um, do something out in the environment, um, like taking, uh, taking strings, right, and, and taking these strings and, and crossing them, tying, tying one into the string to a tree on one side of a river bank, and then crossing the river and tying the other side to the other, and doing something that kind of looks like a weaving, right? And that's that piece of art, right? There might not be a word spoken. Um, and then, but then, though she'll take a photograph of it, or somebody will photograph it, it'll land in a book, and it might just be on the page by itself, this photograph, or there might be text that then she's writing, and that text is then superimposed over that photograph of that image. And sometimes um, when it becomes really interesting to me is when the text becomes one of those threads, right? So she actually strings the text across the page, and it's mirroring the threads that were strung across the river. This is just one example. I mean. Her work is really complex and interesting. So what I see her doing is, you know, the the um, verbi visual or whatever you want to call it, that blending. Um, and I think that um, is the case with, you know, there are many many writers now doing that in books. Uh, there's this incredible book called Ghost of, um, uh, by. by um, Diana, 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 Nguyen, yeah. Diana Nguyen. It's a book I just, yeah. I just adore, yeah. where she has, it's an incredible book that deals in part with her brother's suicide, um, but she has family photographs in the book and where the brother is cut out of the photograph, right? And, and, it's, and it's working with and against like the text that she's writing. So I think those kinds of projects, and I write about them some in my essay too, it's, a, it's somewhat different than, than just ekphrasis on its own as it's been defined, mm -hmm. you know? But definitely the text and the image in those are interacting with one another. So there still is that correspondence, there still is that conversation, right? Um, what Roberto does, and he can speak for himself, but he's doing, He's writing poems and he's creating visual art. And once in a while, the visual art will have like words in it and numbers in it. But most of the time, he's doing a piece of visual art and he's doing poetry. They're, they're not merging on the same canvas, if you will, but they're definitely of the same mind. They're definitely wrestling with a lot of the same issues, topics, subjects, um, philosophies, right? I don't know if you want to speak to it. Um, you hear me? Yeah. Yep. Here, uh, Roberto, let me hand you this microphone. I don't know, I think um, my writing and my drawing are separate and the same, um, but I started off as a visual artist. I used to draw constantly when I was a kid since I was a baby. And, um, but then I, I, I went to poetry because I found books that made English sound like the first time I heard English and um, and it was my it became I think poetry because of the fact that uh, English is my second language um, was where I had so much energy wrapped up that I had to work through that I couldn't work through in my visual work 
and you know, namely by standing up in front of others, uh, speaking English to others. Um, and it was something that I had to go through for a very long time before I started feeling a little bit comfortable. I still feel very uncomfortable with public speaking, mm -hmm. uh, I think largely for those reasons. But, um, you know, I don't, I don't really understand the word phrases. I don't really work like that. Mm -hmm. um, but I, and I don't, I, don't, I don't know where my writing or my drawing comes from. They're, they're I think, separate and the same at the same time. So. I don't know, does that kind of answer the question, Peter? Yeah. I mean, I wonder too if it's not like um, thinking about Cecilia's case, but maybe uh, others. Like, I think there's sort of two things. One is like uh, a rejection of the idea that genres are like these mm -hmm. sort of um, bordered, limited things uh, that um, th that like the the so so for Cecilia, it often feels like the projects like are all interlinked together mm -hmm. and that there's not some sort of essential separation between you know um, the, the various genres. But then I feel like it's also um, perhaps a kind of rejection of a certain kind of expertise um, as mm -hmm. well. Like Cecilia will be like, I don't know anything about filmmaking. And then you'll like read her bio yeah. and she's like made like a hundred films. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and so I feel like that's part of it as, as well that, um, that sort of like, Lack of um, lack of lack of like wanting to be an expert in the one thing, mm -hmm. um, a, in order to sort of um, allow all of the things to, to enter. Mm -hmm. um, and we have a question from Crowdcast, and I'm sorry, it seems as though um, Lorian's connection has been lost. Oh, yeah. um, uh, there were some issues, mm -hmm. so. Um, uh, hopefully she might be back. But we have a question from Crowdcast from Kenzie Allen. Hi, Kenzie. Oh, Kenzie. Um, Hi, Kenzie Allen. <laughs> and this is for everybody. Uh, <laughs> and it is, what do you see as the future of your work or where, uh, or where you are headed next? You have a 2022 book, <laughs> 2024 book? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I don't know. Um, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm like really sick of the page. Uh, and um, uh, I, I don't I don't know how this will manifest, but like I hope that the future of my work is something that is sort of beyond the page, uh, and um, and that means sort of thinking about sound and performance and and certain kind of like um, like book as at least a sort of artistic construction more than like a series of poems. So mm -hmm. that's what I'm thinking a lot about now is that the page feels like this sort of shackle uh, mm. that you know, I want to um, you know, um, um, break out of to be hyperbolic. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't, I've been thinking about, I don't know, again, um, wanting to get back to more collaboration again in the tr true sense of it, because I did a lot of projects in the past that were collaborations with um, visual artists, uh, with um, uh, dancers, with uh, and choreographers, with um, musicians. And, and I'd like to um, go back to more of that, you know, that energy of that, that third mind energy, you know, when you're, you're at, and, you know, that just the way that you're thinking, you know, you're thinking one thing and somebody else is thinking something so completely different and you come together, you bring them together and you have this thing that could not, never have existed in just one or the other, right? And it's that, that merging has always been really exciting and interesting to me. So I'd like to, I'd like to do more um, collaborative work again. Okay, and I think there's, there's a one more from Crowdcast and maybe um, this might close us out. This one's from uh, Edwin Torres, and it's oh. the other as a poetics connects to poet as other, the continual other and what propels poetry into its beyond. Poets are already a fringe denizen. Do you see a cultural climate between other and center where identified terms like Latinx are either obstacles or markers for change? Yes, absolutely, yes. So, okay, the other as a poetics uh, connects to poet as other. The continual other is what propels poetry into its beyond. 
Poets are already a fringe denizen. Do you see a cultural climate between other and center where identified terms like Latinx are either obstacles or markers for change? Hmm. Can Edwin answer his own question? Hi, Edwin. Yeah, hi, Edwin. <laughs> um, Do you want to go? I mean, where t that end of his question, something about where terms like Latinx are obstacles. Are, uh -huh. are obstacles, yeah. I can see that. I can see how those terms, any of these, these terms can become, can be, can be obstacles, right? Um, in the sense that they can be limiting. Right, and they they can be limiting um, because of the way in which others out there define them, right, or see them, right, because they, they, their definitions might be so constricted, right, um, so small that that they can be limiting. Um, uh, I don't know. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I don't. Know, the end of this. I don't know that it like the 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 concept of Latinx on its own is is the thing that's the obstacle, right? It's a it's like an obstacle to um, to a certain kind of reception, maybe, right? Maybe that, that yeah. like um, that people might um, associate it with a certain mm -hmm. you know way of being or something like that. Um, but I'm also like sort of stumbling over the center because like what is the center then mm -hmm. uh, and, and is like the center whiteness and like is whiteness like it, it's, it's like part of what I was thinking before too with the question of culture is like um, you know the sort of notion of um, having to write and investigate your own culture is something that like falls to people who are not white uh, mm -hmm. um, much more than it does uh, to, to um, people who are uh, traditionally white in a certain way, right? And um, and so I, I don't know if I don't know if it feels like maybe whiteness is more of the obstacle um, um, <laughs> than, um, than, than anything else. But no, I don't think that, that it is like the obstacle to making. Like I get mm -hmm. that, that was maybe what I was trying to say earlier is I don't see uh, that on its own as the obstacle to making um, as much as it is like perhaps an obstacle to like reception and publication and mm -hmm. things like that. Yeah. Um, but um, but th those are sort of not not the problems to solve at like the moment of, of creating, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not sure how to answer that question. <laughs> Yeah, Edwin. I want to hear Edwin's answer to his own question. <laughs> um, unfortunately, no way to no way to hear what he has to say. But um, but yeah, um, thank you both so much, uh, Daniel and Brenda. Thank you, Ruben. Thank you, Lorianne, and everyone here. Yeah, thanks, um, everybody. It's been fantastic. Uh, have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.